and you know, there's a there's a an experience I had that just fits that perfectly that I wanted to talk about this morning. And of course, we uh, send each other cosmic emails so that we can <laughs> bounce off of each other, although we don't talk about it. Experience that I had was that um, I, I was I was in a, a real problem. Have you ever had a problem? Yeah. <laughs> Raise a hand if you ever had a problem. Oh, right. <laughs> and so, have you ever been in that state where you you felt like you were at that point of no possibility. I remember in meditation going, oh, I just feel like I'm at the point of zero possibility. And it came all over me, the words, good. The point of zero possibility is the point of infinite possibility. And as I reflected on it, I realized that every point in the universe is an opening to the infinity of the universe. They talk about the zero point in physics and they say that that every particle that pops in and out of the zero point is connected with every other particle in the universe, that the zero point is the point of all possibility. And so, I am at one with all possibility, together. I am at one with all possibility, especially if I think I'm in zero possibility, together. Especially when I think I'm in zero possibility. Because that, that, that surrendering, that letting go, that's, that's when you get in touch with the all of it. My very first church, there were more people in rest homes and convalescent hospitals who were being given care than there were on Sunday morning when I got there. So we divvied up the folks among ourselves, because I didn't have enough hours in the weekend. We all went and visited folks every week. And one woman, who was also a poet, came back and handed me a poem from her experience of visiting someone who was in one of these care facilities. You looked up at me from your wheelchair, your eyes dried from sleep, your glasses smudged with fingerprints. Where is God? you asked. Is God here? Does God even know about me? Yes, I smiled as I gently rubbed your back. Yes, God is here. God knows about you. I kissed your cheek as I looked into your eyes. But where can I find him? you pleaded. Where can God be? God is inside you, I heard my voice say. And you can feel God's love when you shut your eyes. And as you shut your eyes, you seemed to remember. You squeezed my hand with all your might. I'm not so afraid anymore, you sighed. Neither am I, I replied. So, that zero point, where we're looking out there, looking for something, something to fill that zero point within ourselves, something to fill that, what feels like an empty place within our soul, but it's the point of all possibility. A lot of us keep ourselves very busy so that we don't have to feel it. And yet it's always there. It's that place within our heart that, that is in touch with everything. And it's that presence of God that we don't recognize because it's just too close, as they say, nearer than breathing and closer than hands and feet. And because it's so close, we don't recognize that that can't be God. I mean, God's, God's got to knock me over with a lightning bolt or I've got to have an outcome in, in some kind of outer thing. And sometimes things do show up in our lives, but the real presence, the real presence is always there. Now, I argued with this Bible quote this morning. I didn't really want to give it because it's an Easter story, but just pretend like it's Easter. Because it, it's the perfect example of recognizing where is God? I mean, where is God? Where is God? You know, when you, when you look at the news, when you look at the world, when you have news that comes up like this morning in, in New Orleans, there was another shooting. We look at these things, we go, you know, where's God? Where's God? We, we're like Mary in the tomb on Easter morning, standing outside the tomb crying and weeping, and she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, one at the head, the other at the foot, where Jesus' body had been, and they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't recognize that it was him. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. 
Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She recognized him. But why didn't she recognize him? How come she didn't know it was Jesus? Well, maybe a couple of things. Maybe her eyes were covered with tears. We've got our emotional states. I don't know about you, but when I'm in an emotional state, I can't see too much. So I've got to do something with those emotions. And what do I do with those emotions? Well, sometimes I've got to write them down. I've got to get all those false beliefs. And when I'm in that state of turmoil and agitation and upset, it's because I'm believing something stupid, something dumb, something that's not true. And I've got to find out what that something is so I can let it go. So one thing I did many years ago, I was in the middle of um, working and processing. I, actually, I went to a workshop. And what they had us do, and I'll share it with you, and maybe you'll go home and do it. I got two pieces of paper, in this case two legal pads. And on the first one, I wrote down all the false beliefs that I was holding on to that were limiting me. I felt very stuck, very limited. And they were really juicy ones. You gotta get, you've got to get really dramatic about this stuff. Like, it's hopeless. I will be annihilated. Nobody loves me. I'm completely worth, worthless. I mean, everything that's completely negative, because these are the things that are in the subconscious as they surface. I wrote them all down. And then I got a second piece of paper, a second legal pad. And I wrote down the true statement. You know, I am a child of God. I have worth. Um, I can trust in my right outcome. And then I took the first sheet of paper, and what do you think I did with it? I burned it, I shredded it, I ripped it up and flushed it down the power toilet. I don't know what it is you do, but I let it go. And after that weekend, I came back to church and something very interesting happened. Now in that church, I stood, it wasn't like this open air lectern thing. It was one of those old fashioned ones, you know, that's this big, it comes up to here and it's made out of hard, dark wood. And it was up to here, and I had my notes right there. It wasn't as bad as my friend's church. He was down the road, and he had to climb up into a pulpit. It was Jack, a jack in a pulpit, you know, way up there. I didn't have to do that, but it was so separating. And, and I didn't really think about it. I just thought that's what I had to do. But I came back to church, and I couldn't stand behind it. I felt like I was suffocating. See, my master self, my higher self, wouldn't let me because I was letting it out because I let go of all these false beliefs. I let go of these false beliefs and it had an effect on me. It, it caused me to let go of, of, of those limitations, those, those things within us that keep us stuck. What, what, what's going to be uh, studied in the class next week uh, that, that Celeste is going to teach about that, the upper limit that we have to our happiness. And so I let them go and suddenly I just... Even though I still work with my notes, they were out there on the side, and I was able to, and for, for years thereafter, I gave my talks facing people, being there, and it opened me up. And it wasn't a decision I made. What happens when you retrain your beliefs, when you let go of your limitations, I let go of my limitations, together, I let go of my limitations, and I embrace my master self, together, and I embrace my master self. When you do that, what happens? What happens is that you get a freeing, an opening. It's like, um, it's like I don't know. You know, those limitations were there. Maybe they served you. It just reminds me of, again, this is another Easter analogy, of a, of a butterfly trying to push its way, you know, and the wings are pushing against that chrysalis. But those are all those false beliefs. And eventually, it, what that does is it makes the wings stronger, right? And then you can, then you can fly. And so letting those go is so powerful. Well, in the case of Mary in the tomb, getting back to Mary in the tomb, she's, she can't see Jesus there. She doesn't recognize him because she's crying. She's filled with her emotions. She's got her false beliefs. She's also looking in the wrong place. She, even though she knew him so well, she didn't recognize him. Your master self, your right answer, your spiritual something is always there, nearer than breathing, closer than hands and feet. It's that aspect of you. It's, it's who you are. You came in with it. It's not separate from you. It never has been separate from you. And you can embrace it. And you can choose to do right now. Say, where do I want to live from? Do I want to live from you know, dog meat? The old self, the limited self, the, 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 the part of yourself that's, that you've been holding on to? Do you want to live with, from someplace new? There's a wonderful quote 
a wonderful poem by William Wordsworth, and it just fits this. You've heard it before. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, has had elsewhere its setting and comes from afar. Not an entire forgetfulness, and not an utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come. There's that part of you that wants to express, that wants to, to come out, that wants to break free. And it's that part of you that you came in with. You know, children and babies, they know this stuff. That's why we like holding babies, because they remind us. Because that essence is coming out of them. And that's a childlike part of ourselves. So where can you come out and play? Where can, where can you do this? Well, sometimes it takes what a minister friend of mine, uh, Mary Cufferly, called a summoned injection of spiritual will and energy. A summoned injection. You've got to put that energy out there, and you've got to do it with a focus act of will. And how do you do that? Well, I love how Jesus talked about it. And you don't hear this quote in church very much because it sounds, people don't understand it. It's, it sounds kind of violent. But he says, the kingdom of heaven is being subjected to force and forceful souls are taking it now by storm. That's in Mark. The kingdom of heaven is being subjected to force and forceful souls are now taking it by storm. But it means taking and putting that energy into there. Forceful energy, not the personal will, not the ego, but putting that energy out there. Taking those, those spiritual statements of truth and moving with your inner spirit, your inner soul, your inner essence. One of my favorite ways to do it, if I'm really, really stuck, and if you're really, really stuck, maybe this will resonate with you, is to take the first three of the 12 steps and change them into a kind of a, uh, an affirmation, saying, my personality is powerless over this person, this thing, this state of mind. My personality is powerless over it. I've come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity, and I'm willing that your will be done. And taking something like this, moving with it, sometimes when you're really upset about something, sometimes you take your affirmation, you take your, just the name of God, you take something and you move with it and you walk with it. Have you ever done that where, you, where you're stuck and you say, hey, I'm going to take a walk around the block and I'm going to take something with me that's going to get me, like a crowbar, get me out of this state of consciousness. There was a great yoga teacher in India many, many years ago, they say, who was teaching everybody in the village and a man came up to him afterwards and said, you know, I have a real problem with anger. I get angry with people. What do I do? And he said, every time you do, I want you to take your name of God. What is the name of God you use? He said, Ram. Take Ram and walk uh, out in the open air until it subsides, just as long as it takes. And then he said, oh, thank you, thank you. And then about six months later, the same teacher came back, this great yogi, and he was teaching them again, and he saw this man, and he barely recognized him. He was so trim, so fit, and he had a great tan, and he looked so alive, and he looked like he had peace on his face. And he said, how have you been, and how have you changed? What's happened to you? What have you done for yourself? He says, well, mostly I live in the open air. <laughs> Going out and into the world and, and, and taking these things. Now, these are simple tools that you can use, and you can move with them. And... You know, sometimes Jesus talked about that hunger for this change in consciousness. Jesus said, blessed are the ones who hunger and thirst for the goodness of God, for they shall be satisfied. The goodness of God, righteousness, but it really means the goodness of God. You're hungering and you're thirsting for an answer, but you've got to take your desire and then back it up with what? Some kind of action. Taking what you profess to be true and putting it to work in your life. And so what can you do about this? Well, the first thing you can do is realize that God's not out there, that this master self is within and you can access it and that that is the reason why you're here on this planet. You know, with all the news and the television and, 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 the, and the internet and, and all the things that go on in our personal lives, sometimes we lose sight of this. But the only reason why we are here on earth is to awaken to our inner spirit, to awaken to our master self, and to awaken to our spiritual consciousness. There's a great mystic, you may have heard of him, 800 years ago he lived in Germany, his name was Meister Eckhart. And um, 
he, he got in a lot of trouble, but he had a pretty good run. He, he taught for many years. Uh, he was the leader of all the monks in Germany. But then towards the end, they decided he was blasphemous because he was talking too much about the God within. So they were going to put him to death but before they could. He died of natural causes. He tricked them. But he had so many incredible things. This is in the 1200s. And the first thing he said, God will never ask anything of you except for that you let yourself go and let God be God in you. And then he says, and I love this, what good is it to me if this eternal birth of the divine son takes place unceasingly, but it doesn't take place within myself? And what good is it to me if Mary is full of grace, but I am also not full of grace? And what good is it to me if the creator gives birth to the son and I don't give birth to the son in my time, in my culture? So right now, this then is the fullness of time when the Son of God is begotten in us. This Son of God self, this, this within yourself, there is that which is, is being called forth. What Jesus said to the Pharisees, is it not written in your own rule books that you are God's, but you've got to let that inner splendor out. And you came in with it. It's part of you. It's part of your equipment. You're, you're as much, it's as much a part of your equipment as your cruise control and your brakes in a car. It's, a, it's something that you can get in touch with and access and use in your life. But the problem is that we play it small. The problem is that we, we think we have to stay behind the lectern. And sometimes the thing that gets us out of the smaller self and into the master self is something that looks unjust and unfair and we don't like it because it's the fastest way and the easiest way for our higher self, our master self, to break us free. And uh, I like telling this story every year or so, but it's a good one about what happened to me. Because I thought I was doing pretty well, giving my talks next to the lectern, you know, and I wasn't having any barriers between me and people. But I came into a church where it was a, it was a different time zone than I was used to. And I noticed that every Sunday, the people looked like, you know, the two people in American Gothic down at the Art Institute? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was not reaching anybody. And here it was Easter. Here's another Easter thing. Easter Sunday, I was going to speak to more people than I'd ever spoken to in my life. And I felt so good about my talk. It had all the, hit all the points. It had all the ideas and all the stories and all the quotes. And it was great. And I had my notes up there. And I gave the talk at 9 and forget about it. I was dealing with American Gothic. Well, I went back to my office thinking, well, I don't know. Maybe it'll change at 11 somehow. Maybe something will change. I left my office, shut the door, I heard a click, and I went, oh, I left my notes in there. I tried to open the door, and it was locked. So I went to get the hide key because there's always a hide key I don't know when or where, but the hide key was gone. And I never did find out where it went. So I figured, well, I'll go to the administrator of the church, because she had a copy of it. She was always there for both services, but she had to go to a brunch, and she left early. Well, she always left her phone on. She turned her phone off for some reason or another. Hmm. Well, there's only one other person I could think of. It was the custodian. I'll be able to get the custodian to open it. And the custodian had gone out to Lowe's or to Home Depot to pick up something, and he was nowhere to be seen, and he didn't have his phone on either. Only God can screw things up this badly. But here I was sitting now in front of this not-too-receptive group of people on a Sunday morning, and somebody, one of the ushers came up to me. The word got out, you know. And he said, you know, it's okay, we're going to take care of it. you got a locksmith in the second row, and he always drives his lock truck, locksmith truck to services. He'll be able to jimmy the door open, no problem. So I saw him go down and talk to the guy, and it didn't look like it was going so well. And the usher came back and he says, I don't know why, but he won't do it. I found out later for some reason he didn't like my talks either, so he wasn't going to help it. I never really saw him after that. So... Now, and Megan asked after the first service, she said, well, what was that about? That was because it was what I needed. And we think, we think of our, see, we take these things personally. I never take anything personally, together. I never take anything personally because all things work together for good, together. Because all things work together for good. So I'm sitting up there and I'm going, okay. And I just got up and I gave the best talk I knew how to give, but I was kind of figuring it out as I went along, trying to remember. And they gave me a standing ovation. And afterwards, at brunch, Jane Hart, my meditation teacher, is talking to me about it, and she's laughing. And I said, wow, I'm glad I'll never have to do that again. 
And she said, what do you mean? You're going to do that every Sunday for the rest of your life. Yeah. And I, I have quotes and stuff, but I don't have all those notes and stuff that I can refer to. Why? Well, you know why? Because I'm supposed to be in the moment. And it's never gotten easier. Now, when you move out, this is why, people, this is why we have to work with ourselves a little bit. Because moving out of the limited self into the greater self, the master self, is sometimes challenging because we, we can't play it small anymore. You know, when your kids are growing up and, uh, and, 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 and they've got to go to school or they've got to go to college. You know, I'm working with Jason on a lot of these things. You, you, you know, now, now I've got to drive myself. And there's a part of you that just wants to stay home and play with your Legos, you know. <laughs> stay at the level that you were. So the question for you is, how can you move into that that something more, that something new, that greater self, that part of yourself that is that is that is greater. But what it takes is a summoned injection of divine will. It takes accessing the inner power that was fully expressed in Jesus and his potential for each one of us. It's there. You carried it in with you. I love I was just reading recently about how everybody made a mistake when they kept calling Jesus's Miracles, miracles, because they weren't. The word mirare, from which the word miracle came from, means to be astonished. And they almost never used that word in the Bible for it. It was instead dynamis, acts of power. He didn't do miracles. It wasn't some kind of magical thing from outside. It was an act of power. It was, it was something that he engaged himself with. I heard again after many, many years or watched on YouTube, the great interview between Oprah Winfrey and Maya Angelou, right after she was invited to give her poem to, for the inauguration of the presidency back in the 90s. And it was a great life-transforming moment. Did you, do you remember seeing that? It was a very powerful moment. And Oprah said, how did you do it? And she said, I came in like we all do, trailing wisps of glory. And I realized that I am a child of God. And I got in touch with that master self, that higher self. And I got in touch with it, and then I stepped into the poem and I delivered it. And you can take whatever it is that's in front of you, whatever it is you're grappling with in your life, and get in touch with that greatness within you, that child of God self, that reality. And maybe using the meditation that we did today, clothing yourself in infinite, generous spirit and letting it move with you easily everywhere you go and whatever you do. Taking something and moving with it, but, but getting out of the familiar self, getting out of the familiar self. And it may take something that looks unjust. It may take something that looks like a limitation to get you out of your limitation. It may take not taking things so personally and detaching from the appearances of things or the opinions of others. You know when Jesus said that uh, quote about the kingdom of heaven is being subjected to force and forceful souls or taking it by storm. There's a Catholic cosmologist, Brian Swim, who explained this. He said, this is a kind of inner psychic violence. It's a powerful word. Where a breaking free is necessary. We have to do this to get in touch with our creativity. We have to break off from what other people say that we are or what we should be and say, this is what I am. That's moving into that, that unlimited self, that, that, that child of God self. You know, in that, in that conversation with Oprah Winfrey, uh, uh, Oprah asked my angel, is that the greatest experience of her life? She said, no, the greatest experience of my life was when she was very young. And in her autobiography, she said at that point, she was a madam. And she decided she wanted to break free and move into another line of work to become a, a, an actress at that point. So she took elocution lessons in San Francisco from a guy named Randolph Wilkerson. And in that, in that class, they were reading from a book out loud called Lessons in Truth, Unity's book by Emily Cady. And they were taking turns, and it was her turn. The line came up, I am a child of God. And Randolph Wilkerson said, I don't think you believe that. Say it again. I am a child of God. She really didn't believe it. She was an agnostic. Say it again. I am a child of God. And he kept saying it over and over again until she became very angry. 
very angry that he was humiliating her in front of all these people, many of whom were well known and very prominent. And finally he said, say it again. And she said, I am a child of God. And she said, Oprah, Oprah, the skies opened up and it's like, it's like it came over me all weird. My, my, it's like my feet went out six feet from uh, either side and my head exploded. She had all these great analogies. But she said she's never gotten over that. It was the greatest experience of her life because she got in touch with the master self, the real self of you. Now, what are you doing for her? You say, well, I've never had an experience that dramatic. Well, she needed it. She was really having to make a big move in her life. But for you, what can you do to get in touch with this? And what can you do to move with this generous spirit? So let's, uh, let's, let's close our eyes and, and, and take that affirmation again. Take that visualization. Sometimes just getting into a feeling that touches your heart and moves your soul. I clothe myself in this generous spirit. <coughs> And I let it move with me easily, everywhere I go, in whatever I do. I clothe myself in generous spirit. And I let it move with me easily, effortlessly, wherever I go, in whatever I do. I feel the warmth that I draw around the shoulders of my being. I see and I envision the glowing, shimmering, light-filled presence of this heart space energy, the generosity of heart, the generosity of spirit. This is what I came in with. This is the who that I am. Thank you, thank you, God. So it is. Amen. And now take a deep breath and let it out and move into this now moment and know that in this now moment is everything you need. Whatever desire is in your heart, whatever you hold in your mind or your heart is a problem, infinite spirit, generous spirit is the answer. But you have to call it forth. And sometimes taking a moment to imagine and feel know in that childlike space of your soul, your heart, can bring forth this spiritual awareness in a way that is like no other. And so now just take these thoughts, imagine them and feel them and know them and let the warmth of this imagery Warm the core of your being. I clothe myself in generous spirit. And I let it move with me easily. Ready to move. Ready to express everywhere I go. And in whatever I do. Perhaps imagine a shimmering, light-filled gown or comforter. And you envelop your shoulders and your whole being. And I clothe myself in generous spirit. I feel the generosity of divine love. I feel and envision shimmering vibration, the light-filled essence of God warming myself. I touch into the generosity of spirit that is not separate from me, but that I envision As a shimmering, glowing, light-filled robe or blanket that I put around myself, I clothe myself in generous spirit, and I feel the spirit warm me, 
move me. And I let it move with me easily, effortlessly, experiencing. of the great comforter. Ready to express. Always there. Recharging my being, my innermost core, my heart. So that wherever I am, God is. And all is well. Wherever I am, I am warmed by infinite spirit. The generosity of heart. Everywhere I go, and in whatever I do, And I bring myself back to this feeling imagery. Of being enveloped in the warmth of generous spirit. The light filled. Peace filled. Powerful. Love of God. and it moves me and I'm ready. I take this feeling image into my heart. Into my heart. there's anything that I can do to touch someone's heart, to lift them up, to give them some encouragement or remind them of the warmth of their own generous spirit, I lift them up with me as I once again imagine being clothed in generous spirit and letting it move with me easily, ready to express everywhere I go and whatever I do. with spirit, spirit moves with me and I am in the flow of this now moment generous spirit warm, loving peace filled spirit thank you, thank you God and so it is Amen so we're going to take our offering and our offering statement is I give from my master self and I receive abundantly together I give from my master self, and I receive abundantly. And silently. And again aloud together. I give from my master self, and I receive abundantly.